Okay, so you you put people under. You're in the operating room, put a, putting them uh, to sleep, and then waking them up. <laughs> That's the most important part, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, speaking of sleep, how how is or isn't anesthesia like sleep? Is it very similar, or is it a distinct brain state completely? It is. If you want to piss off a bunch of sleep specialists, you can tell them that uh, oh, that this anesthetic is just like chemical sleep. That's uh, they. They don't like that, and they're right that there 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 are some similarities. And as you go through, uh, there there's depth to anesthesia, um, as you might imagine. It's not a straight line necessarily, but as you get deeper, as the doses of anesthetic go up, uh, you pass through some sleep like stages on your way down, and of course on your way back up. But where we get to for surgery, as you might imagine, is a state of unarousability where you have uh, no memory formation, no conscious uh, awareness that we know of, immobility, um, and hypnosis. So those are that's a much, much deeper uh, state of consciousness, and the EEG looks uh, radically different from what you would see during sleep. I see. And so how does it compare uh, just at a high level, the EEG signature? So it's much, uh, it's almost much simpler. So what uh, what's interesting about sleep, and there, there's a lot to say about this, but um, sleep, you know, there sleep has an architecture, right? Yeah. Sleep is is ancient. Uh, it's in every species that we know of, uh, and you cycle through through different stages. And um, when you put someone into an anesthetized state, which we do regularly, millions of times uh, across the country every day, um, maybe not millions, but uh, what you see is a much more organized rhythm and it's a really simple rhythm like the standard we actually have monitors that are built for monitoring depth of anesthesia using EEG and what they're targeting you know the the like the, the good numbers are describe a, a pattern that when i talk to um residents and, and teach basically explain like this if a five-year-old kid could draw it the patient is surgically anesthetized and that's because it's so simple and loopy, and there isn't a whole lot of spatial complexity in the signal. And that's sort of what I, one way of thinking of what's going on in the brain. It, this, the soup is being kept warm by these thalamocortical rhythms, mm. but there isn't a whole lot of information being processed, and there isn't a lot of informational content in that EEG. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, as, as you get to uh, lighter stages of anesthesia and eventually wakefulness, all of that sensory information, the you know chaotic noise of 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 you know the 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 smelly, tasty, you know touchy world, all of that comes in, and that actually that that complexity is reflected in the complexity of the EEG. Mm -hmm. That rhythms are much more complicated rhythms, much finer detail, um, and so that's it's a it's a simplistic way of thinking about it. But actually, anesthesia, anesthetic EEG is is simple at a space, and that's how you know that you're doing a, a your, your job and keeping the patient uh under i see i see so i mean roughly speaking if from a naive standpoint if you don't know anything about anesthesia but you do know the basics of sleep architecture you've got non-rem sleep stage one two three four you've got rem sleep non-rem sleep is when you've got these large slow waves that you see in the eeg uh signature is are you seeing large slow waves akin to that in anesthesia even if they're not the same frequency or is it completely completely different no you still you still have those large slow waves but you don't a a typical um a, a typical thing that you see during sleep um and there's another rhythm it's called an alpha rhythm and this will come up again um that is very prominent during uh during general anesthesia and not so much uh during during normal sleep so this is something that happens when you close your eyes. You can see a prominent alpha rhythm in your occipital cortex, which is where vision is processed. So you can kind of make that link between eyes closed and suddenly there's no external sensory input. So it kind of defaults to this rhythm. Um, in, uh, during general anesthesia, you're mo like anywhere you look in the brain is going to have that strong alpha rhythm. Um, that's not something that you typically see during any I see. And so obviously, uh, people are unresponsive during anesthesia. And if they're in deep anesthesia, we presume that there's no conscious awareness at all. 
And then there's this this component of amnesia. Um, my understanding is that when people come out of anesthesia, depending on the anesthetic, depending on the depth, there's going to be uh, some time that they can't remember even after they start to come out of it or when, when memory formation is impaired. Thinking about um, conscious awareness versus memory formation and impairment, how do we know? I mean, is it possible that there is some level of basic awareness even in deep anesthesia? It's just that memories can't form of it, and so people don't report it? Yeah, that's sort of a terrifying philosophical concept of like, what if you did experience everything during anesthesia, you just couldn't remember it? Mm -hmm. Uh, And you sort of, it's like there's a black mirror aspect of that. Um, And, you know, I I, I think conceptually, like, you, you you can't know that for sure. What we do know is the incidence of awareness under general anesthesia, which is about one in a thousand. Um, And it doesn't seem to be something that you can prevent by monitoring EEG. So to say that we know why it happens, (laughs) is actually (laughs) not clear either, which is a little, you know, a little disturbing, but it is very rare. And when I say awareness, I'm talking about anything like, uh, you know, sight sounds, not necessarily pain and like feeling like you're getting cut into um, which, you know, would honestly be terrifying. That's an ex- extraordinarily rare, um, where you have like full awareness of sensory perception, uh, under anesthesia. Um, but yeah, so there, there is, is it like back when anesthesia was being developed and, uh, these concepts were being worked out, people actually drew a distinction. So we stopped using the word pain, right? So there's, uh, in w- to talk about a patient who's anesthetized. Is the patient in pain? Sounds like a reasonable question when you're getting, you know, a scalpel put to you. But technically, pain is a conscious process, right? Um, and these patients are unconscious. They have no recollection of it. They still can have a physiological response, hearing, heart rate elevation. But um, if you wake them up afterwards, they'll have no recollection. Well, obviously, it may still be in pain, um, but they won't have recall of the actual traumatic event. The other thing that um, sort of uh, happened with the language is that we started using this term nociception, right? It's which is uh, the idea that signals can get through, but they don't integrate. They don't integrate into conscious mm-hmm. awareness. And you can see that actually in a number in a number of ways. So one of the things, so I, I do uh, anesthesia for neurological surgery. So things like aneurysm, uh, cerebrovascular aneurysm repair, um, a, a number of other things, tumors. And one of the things that we do is we monitor uh, cortical function. We want to make sure the patients aren't having a stroke, but they're not impinging on something important. And uh, we do something called somatosensory evoked potentials, meaning you just stimulate a nerve, like a, your uh, tibial nerve or a radial nerve, and you can get a mixed sensory uh, motor response. And you can actually track that impulse as it goes all the way up, and you can eventually see it in your uh, cortex. So you can see that the the signal is clearly getting through. There's a sensory signal that's traveling from the periphery to the center. You can see it with visual evoked potentials. If you flash a light, you'll see uh, things uh, going off in the occipital cortex, even under anesthesia. Brainstem, auditory evoked potentials. All these things are actually routine uh, things that we do to make to, to monitor the integrity of the nervous system, to which means that information is getting through. What's not happening is that mysterious process of integrating it into conscious awareness, hmm. and that is still very much uh, that's just kind of the the edge of, of of science right now is understanding how that happens and what that what that consists of. Mm-hmm. So ba- basically, I think it sounds like we understand. You know, we take an information from our sensory organs. We know that that information goes up to our sensory areas of our brain, and then it goes elsewhere in the brain. It gets combined and integrated, and stuff happens to it. It's processed before it comes into our conscious awareness. Um, and we sort of know at that level that happens. We don't actually know what that integration process looks like exactly. We we can get some clues, and I'll point to work at a University of Michigan that I like in particular. Uh, looking at EEG and anesthetic states, uh, George Mashur is, is one of my 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 favorite researchers over there and uh, former head of their department. But uh, you can look at cortical organization, right? So how does information move locally and globally 
uh, during anesthesia that you see a lot of uh, a, a, a change basically in the architecture of these these cortical modules. So you can uh, see a lot less again complexity and uh, local correlations in activity that um, seem to relate to depth depth of anesthesia. So again, it's this idea that you're disrupting these uh, local and long range interactions. And that's probably related, those kinds of interactions, that's probably what integration consists of. And the thing that we call consciousness is, I would say, very likely to be the result of all of those uh, you know, the, that, that those inner, uh, interconnected pieces of your, your cortex talking to each other in real time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it makes intuitive sense because, you know, very, very roughly speaking, right. Like we, we have a sense of touch. We have a, a you know, we have our eyeballs, we have our ears, we have all these different streams of information, but we don't, we don't consciously perceive all of these things separately. We have this one unified scene from moment to moment. So at some sense, all of these different channels have to be literally integrated together somehow so that we have that unified perception. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that is, that is the mystery there. there there's a lot of, um, this is actually one of the reasons why I stopped studying consciousness very early on. It's because it seemed like one of those insolvable, not insolvable, but almost like philosophical questions mm -hmm. that you could come to any number of conclusions that are essentially not testable or very difficult to test. And there's been a lot of, um, I guess, progress in the field of consciousness studies over the last uh, 20 years and that now we're, we're, I think we're starting to get somewhere. But very early on, I realized that the way that uh, i like to think about these problems and kind of attack them is more of like an engineering point of view that maybe I'm not going to understand how the system works, but can I at least move it, it predictably by doing stuff at it. <laughs> so drugs, electricity, you know, the non-ordinary states of consciousness, how can you put these things together in a predictable way to get an outcome, whether that outcome be a particular state of consciousness uh, dreaming or a mental health outcome or a transformational experience. And that is some of the most exciting things that I've seen uh, going on, uh, you know, in, in kind of the, the, the mental health revolution that we're, I, I hope, I think in the midst of right now. So there's probably, I would imagine, a large number of anesthetics. There's certainly multiple to choose from. Can you give us a sense for how, as an anesthesi anesthesiologist, you choose what anesthetic to use for a given application? Uh, the one that I know for 100% certainty is going to get into the patient, <laughs> no mistakes there, uh, and uh, the one that makes people not want to throw up afterwards. And mm. that actually limits our choices to a very, uh, my favorite anesthetic is a is a combination anesthetic. So it's sevoflurane, which is a gas that you breathe in. Uh, one of the honestly the, the coolest things about anesthesia, people say we don't really know how anesthesia works, and it's like true. We don't really know how anything works. But one thing we do know is that things like sevoflurane, isoflurane, ether, these are all kind of related molecules, work across just shockingly well across the entire animal kingdom. Hmm. Now that even plants, you can anesthetize a plant, <laughs> what? which is kind of messed up. And it's, you know, that, that raises a whole you know, different set of uh, you know, philosophical issues, I guess. But the point is, it's a very old and deep process. You know, these are molecules that are related to uh, things that archaebacteria were probably secreting into their environment to silence the local competition. Um you know that's that uh, th th they're not really com complex molecules. So that's that's my f the first uh, my first stop is the gas sevoflurane. If you breathe it in, you breathe it out. I know it's getting in, and it's extremely effective. And the dose is basically is, is very predictable from patient to patient. Um, now there are problems with it, and that uh, people can sometimes wake up a little bit delirious. The it takes a while to wash out. Um, and, you know, one of the least fun aspects of surgery and anesthesia is the nausea afterwards, which, you know, I've <laughs> experienced it. I've seen it. It's uh, not something that I particularly look forward to. So the other drug that we add is a drug called propofol, made famous, unfortunately, by Michael Jackson. But 
It's been around for, uh, I'd say, about 30 years now. It is extremely safe, um, and it's one of the most widely used drugs in anesthesia. It doesn't uh, cause nausea. It's hypnotic. It doesn't really uh, treat pain. You need a different uh, group of drugs for that, but it's a hypnotic agent that causes loss of consciousness very reliably. And the thing that I like about it is it comes on and it comes off very quickly. So older anesthetics, the problems were... You know, uh, it would interfere with your heart rate, your blood pressure, it would cause uh, liver, kidney issues. Uh, it would take forever to wash out. Um, this is really what modern anesthesia has has done very well, is turn anesthesia from something that is, frankly, scary. In, nine, in the 80s, you know, there was a 2020, you remember that show? I think it's still on. Uh, uh, a show where they, they said something like one in one in 500 patients won't wake up from anesthesia, which is like a scary, crazy thing. Hmm. That honestly, I, I don't think the numbers were quite that high, but it was dangerous. Um, in the intervening uh, 30, 40 years, a lot of changes have happened to make anesthesia the, I think, the safest specialty in medicine. Um, in that, you know, now we can monitor patients uh, who are unconscious with, you know, great precision. Uh, there's a, again, a, re a really good, uh, safety record. The drugs have improved. Anyway, that's not, this actually will, relates to something I think we're going to talk about, um, later, which is that the, you know, the, because of these improvements in safety, because now we operate on sicker patients, because we can now, you know, anesthetize parts of your body and keep your, your brain intact. That's opened a lot of doors in terms of the variety of, of of anesthetic states that we see on a regular basis and have led to some very surprising uh, observations that um, you know I think we'll, we'll talk about a bit, like in particular dreaming and um, related re related phenomena. So whether it's propofol, whether it's some of these gases that you mentioned, what are the mechanisms of action here? Do they do they have very distinct mechanisms of action between these drugs, or are they similar to one another? So they're, they're different and each the, the there's other classes of drugs like uh, dexmedetomidine, uh, for example, that have very specific targets uh, in that case an alpha two adrenoreceptor, um, which basically suppresses all of your sympathetic outflow and really puts you that's as close as we get to like chemical sleep, I think is is dexmedetomidine. But these other drugs, propofol, sulforin, they're pretty dirty. Uh, in fact, as a general theme of my experience in psychopharmacology has been that the dirtier drugs are the more effective drugs. Ketamine is another example that mm. so can be used for general anesthesia. It is fantastically uh, profligate in the number of receptors that it seems to hit. Yeah. And um, just for just for listeners, that's what you mean by dirty. They they interact with many different receptors. Yes. Things. Sorry. That's it's it's not a clean a clean drug is one that we think of as has a very simple, clear mechanism of action. It binds at one receptor. Sevoflurane, for example, isoflurane will bind uh their binding sites at GABA receptors, ion channels, voltage gated calcium channels, presynaptic release machinery. Like there's all kinds of uh, ways in which it slows down neural transmission and may uh, lead to the unconscious state. The GABA receptor is really, that is the main inhibitory receptor or the main uh, receptor for the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA um, in the brain. So what we're doing is we're basically turning up the inhibition in, in your brain with a uh, drug like propofol or sevoflurane. Uh, phenobar pentobarbital falls in that same category. Um, until you basically suppress all activity and your your brain goes quiet and you stop forming memories, stop perceiving any uh, anything anything outside of you. 